Shall we begin? Shall we? Let's. All right, everybody. Welcome to episode 71 of Burrows and Burbs. We're into our third season. I'll begin by introducing my very special co-host, Roberto Cabrera in New York. Hello, everybody. And we've got two, not one, but two special guests today on our fabulous Chicago show. We've got Carrie McCormick, the billion dollar queen of Chicago. I don't think that's overstating it. And Carrie has said, if you want to understand Chicago and you want to understand the lending environment and you want to understand how the money moves, we've got to invite Mark Ollie. So wave, wave to the crowd, Mark. That's Mark. Thank you. Good to be here. And he's our lending expert on uh, how you finance all the luxury in Chicago. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce you, Carrie, and tell us, uh, I guess, just give us your own introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you for all of that. And it's my pleasure to be here with each and every one of you. Um, I am here in cold Chicago. It's nice and snowy today. We started seeing some flakes here. But um, again, my name is Carrie McCormick. I'm a real estate broker in Chicago. I've been a broker here for over 22 years. So it's been quite some time. I started my career in development. Um, I worked with some of the larger developers here in Chicago back in the late 90s and um, then pivoted to brokerage after the, the lovely market crash in 2008. I work for At Properties Christie's International here. We do not have a Douglas Elliman here, which is surprising that we don't have one here. But I work for, again, um, At Properties Christie's International. We are based here in Chicago, and we are expanding all over the place. So it's a good place to be. My background is my messy office. So welcome to my office. Now, Roberto's at Brown Harris Stevens. You don't have one of those either. No, we don't have one of those. No. Do you want a Brown Harris Stevens and an element? We, of course. The more the merrier here. We have our 150th anniversary coming up just this year. So we are the oldest. Wow. Yeah, we don't have you guys here. Well, it sounds like you don't need Brown Harris Stevens and element, that you've got pretty much Chicago in the palm of your hand, that you've got it all covered. Yes. I love Chicago. I live and breathe what I do. Um, it moves quickly here. Chicago is a fabulous city. Anyone that's ever been here, it's it's a world-class city. Our real estate, I think, is um, so affordable compared to a lot of other markets that are out there. Um, it's a great place to be. It really is. And for you, for us to say that you are a billion dollar producer with the numbers that you have compared to New York is really extraordinary. I mean, I was looking at something that you represented, which is 3,500 North Lakeshore Drive. Mm -hmm. yes. The price of that is incredible compared. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's a, you know, it's a pre-war building. We have a lot of pre-war buildings here, um, which do you guys refer to them as pre-war buildings? Yeah, we do. Because okay. we do that. I mean, that's a very big designation for us. And that, when I was looking through a lot of the property you represent, I really actually realized how it's, of all the cities in the US that I've seen, your housing product mm -hmm. seems the most similar to what we find in New York. And that particular building is like, you could have literally pulled it straight out of New York. But yeah. then when I looked at the price, I literally fell over backwards. Like, is it, it's literally only $1.1 $1 .1 million? Yes, it is. And it's 3,500 square feet. And, and restored to perfection. It, it's unbelievable. That apartment here would be seven. I know it. That's why I say Chicago is such a great value city. We love when folks from New York come here because they are just they're astounded by what you get for your price here. Um, we have uh, some fabulous pre-war buildings here. We've got East Lakeshore Drive, which has got some of the most incredible co-ops in the city as well. Um, and that's where I work alongside with Mark. He I call him the co-op king. Because, you know, co-ops can be a little tricky when it comes to financing or purchasing or people understanding what a co-op is. And unlike New York, co-ops are not common here, right? We don't have as many here. Yeah. Um, but Mark does a fabulous job of walking through, you know, what a co-op is with folks. And then also, more importantly, is how to get the financing done in those co-ops. Let's start with the defining the market. How big is the market 
who's moving in, are they buying or are they renting? What I'm learning from Roberto is that two thirds of New York is for rent. And then of the other one third that's for sale, tell me if I'm wrong, Roberto, most of it's co-op. Is that also true in Chicago? No, it's very different. So Chicago, I would say we're probably more of a 70-30 split, 70% sale, you know, homeowners. And we've got a very strong rental market here and it keeps growing, but I would say we're probably about maybe 30 to 40% rental. Um, and, you know, our city is divided into, we call it a market within a market, because when we talk about Chicago, and again, similar to any other market that's out there, each neighborhood performs very differently. You know, for example, I'm in Lincoln Park, and there's different neighborhoods, um, Gold Coast or Streeterville, they perform very differently than the Lincoln Park neighborhood. So again, um, thank you for the map. There you go. So those are all our neighborhoods. And within each neighborhood, again, there's different housing stock, whether it's more single family home, whether it's more condo, townhome, co-op, more rental. So you really have to, to dive into each of the neighborhoods and the markets. Let, let's do some, Carrie. I always like to start kind of wide when we come into some of these cities. And like, I would generally, you know, talk about New York and say, you know, uptown is typically much more residential than midtown, which is very, um, you know, it's very business oriented. Downtown becomes a little bit more eclectic and different and a little more edgy. Um, how would you describe Chicago as far as what's north, what's south from the city center? What's, you know, give me a certain sense and then we will kind of come in a little bit. Yeah, our city center is called the loop. And I'm just looking at your map here. Um, this one better? Yeah, it's probably a little bit of my eyesight though too, I have to say. <laughs> So if you just look at Cloudgate, which you can see that's kind of like, looks like it's our bean, the, the bean, you know, that's kind of the, the loop area, if you will, or the city center, you know, starting there. And as you go north, right, as you go north, you're gonna get into all the different neighborhoods. And on this map, you can see it says near north side, but that's gonna be like the Gold Coast area, um, Old Town, Lincoln Park, Lakeview. Um, neighborhoods. And then we go west as well. You'll see the big yellow line, which is our expressway there. And you see, I can see on this map, it says Logan Square. That is, if I was going to equate that to New York, and by no means do I ever compare Chicago to New York, because I know you guys are fabulous there. Um, that would be like your Soho neighborhood. So Bucktown is very artsy, eclectic. Is it easier on this to talk in terms of colors? You, at the center, the loop, is the bright pink. That's Correct. the center of town. You're in the north. You're in the purple, just above the pink, purple. right? Yep. Yeah. And, that, and that's called Lincoln Park. Yes. And that's the most exclusive place to be? That and the Gold Coast, I would say, are. Lincoln Park consists of a lot of single-family homes you know, price ranges probably between 2 million and 10 million in that neighborhood. Um, the Gold Coast is a mix of single family homes and condos. Again, can range from 2 million to 20 million. Is Gold Coast central Chicago pink or is it just below that? Um, it's uh, pink. Okay. It's pink. Yeah. So the closer I get to the pink, the more expensive it probably is. Yeah. And then East Bandero did all those towers. All those towers are going to be in the pink area? Be in the pink area. Okay. And then 50 years ago, there really was only the pink. And now has it expanded to all the way up to the red and all the way down to the to the to the green? Yeah. So our neighborhoods keep growing. Development, just like any city, you know, they run out of space to build, right? So they keep expanding to the west, to the south, to the north. So all of these neighborhoods are emerging. I was going to say one thing that you guys can't see on this map is we do have a beautiful lakefront to the right. Um, and just with our pricing, the closer also you get to the lakefront, the more expensive it gets as well. Some of us in the East only know Chicago from John Hughes movies, watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Of and uh, they leave this beautiful Center Hall Colonial. Where would that be? Uh, and then they head in and go watch a Cubs game. So uh, orient me uh, and all the other dumb Yankees uh, East who don't really know what, what is the geography of, the, of Ferris Bueller and those leafy suburbs. That's so funny. So. Um, 
that was filmed in Highland Park, and which is a northern suburb, which is not on this map because it's out of the city. It's in the suburbs of, of Chicago. And there's another movie, which is, um, gosh, which is the other one, you guys? It is um, Home Alone. So, you know, yeah. that movie it was also filmed in Winneka, which is another suburban um, neighborhood of of this of Chicago, but we don't see it on the map. It's it's in the suburbs. Isn't so, Risky Business also? I think so. Is that bad? Lake, lake, is there a place called Lake Shore or some, Lake Land, Lake View? No. Well, there's um, Lake View. I guess maybe we have to do a quick Google search. Is it bad that I don't know that? <laughs> I don't know, but it was, where, where did, uh, Lake Forest? Does that sound right? Lake yeah. Forest, yeah. So that's- Is that where Michael forest. Jordan lived? That kind of thing? Yep. And is yep. that north? It is all north. So that's out of the city. Again, it's not on your map here. Um, but one question that you asked is, you know, who's moving into Chicago, right? And I understand we have a lot of, um, I'd say we have a lot of more negative headlines, unfortunately, about the Chicago real estate market. I'm born and raised here. I love Chicago. I think we're a very resilient city. And just like any city, you know, through the pandemic, you know, every city had issues, right? And of Chicago had its fair share of them. Um, we are seeing a lot of the suburban folks moving into the city or having some second homes here. We do get um, a lot of relocation here too. We've got some fabulous hubs of large companies that are here. We've got McDonald's headquarters are here. Um, Groupon is here. You know, we've got a Goog big Google office here that's moving. Um, I don't know. There's just so many that are here. So Citadel's keeping a branch here. So we didn't lose them all to Florida. So we've got a branch that's still here. Um, so we do get a lot of um, relocation into Chicago as well. But you must be seeing an exodus of people to Florida, to Texas, to the Southwest. I mean, you're like we're experiencing that a lot. And John in Connecticut's the same thing. People are leaving, and a lot of people who have big homes, they don't know. They're you know, from a standpoint of inventory, they're afraid to put them on the market. There's nowhere to go, or there hasn't been. Um, so they've been going south. But also, we I'm just curious about how your city responded to COVID in the sense that we had a big exodus from the city center, and people went. They went to the Hamptons, they went to Connecticut. Some of them went to stay, but a lot of people bought another home in these places. So it becomes, and also with the remote working is the concept of co-primary residence, not necessarily a pied tier in the city, but you're actually living pretty much in both places. Are you experiencing that? Did you have people leave? And Roberto, we have a few left here in New Canaan, just a few. So <laughs> just wanted to let you know. I, know. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we we did have a good exodus out of the city during COVID um, because, you know, that work from or remote working really played into it. Right. And I think every city experienced it when you can work wherever you want. You know, there's no reason to be in the city. Um, we had our fair share of crime that had happened in the city during that time as well. So it really pushed a lot of people out. Our inventory rised quite a bit. We had such a surplus, you know, as I was like watching all the data in Florida or Arizona or different markets who had zero inventory or no inventory, multiple offers. We just kept getting the inventory. Yeah. You know, we had so much in Streeterville and Gold Coast. We had so much supply there. And, you know, through the last year, which has been interesting, it, of course, with high supply um, and no demand there, the prices just started coming down. It kept coming down and they got to a point where the savvy consumers knew this is a buy right so they looked at it as an opportunity to buy something they knew that chicago is going to come back you know we're going to you know the work from home thing is starting to end here so they knew that these were good buys so we started seeing some volume and some action and now i'm starting to see and mark can back me up on this the inventory in these neighborhoods is now low. There's been a lot more demand for it, and we're starting to see the prices rise back up. So it's been an interesting little roller coaster we went through um, during COVID. Are you reflecting where you were pre-COVID now, numbers-wise? Not yet. We're 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 reflecting 2019, 2018, and we're really starting to fall back into cycle. Yeah, I think when we're, you say we're not, when you say not yet. Not yet back to those prices and not yet back to that volume? 
Correct. Just both, actually. So I think um, I think we're going to get there this summer to fall. We're we're on the path to it. Mark, when they come in from the suburbs and uh, they encounter a co-op board for the very first time, how's that go? I get them comfortable with it because after all these years, I've gotten to know many of the boards and the people that sit on them. They're good people. And for the most part, it's really a, an exchange of information. It's a dialogue help you get comfortable with group living. You know, if they got to that point by submitting all their paperwork um, and putting together the package for board review, um, they know their assets are before they meet. And it's usually an asset-based approval. They wanna make sure you're comfortable living there. And just so the group knows, my name's Mark Ali, I'm the co-op lending manager here at Chicago Financial Services. And I've been an active lender exclusively in the co-op market for 21 years here. Before that, I used to own a newspaper, which is a very different world. But, uh, <laughs> but if I want something great in Chicago and I say, but I don't want to go, I don't want somebody picking through my financials. I don't want, I don't want to be, I don't want to go through that process. Are you going to tell me that the, the, the path to great real estate in Chicago, I'm going to have to get over it, right? I'm going to have to consider co-ops or, 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 or not. Are the best buildings co-op? Um, well, in part, yes, I think the, the co-op community is a very much a boutique community and a big department store. We're like one of the great boutiques in Bergdorf uh, in terms of real estate. And there's lots of quality other things that you can purchase in the city that are not a co-op. But a co-op um, like New York, that, that pre-war people love it. it they're, when they were built, they are in the best parcels in the city. You can't buy those spots anymore. They're built by noted designers that people still talk about today. And the families that decided to come together to build that building really formed our city. You know, it was their in-town place. You know, it might be two floors on top of 1500, which is going for like $14 million now. But back then that was their in-town place to have dinner and theater and all those things. And then they go back up on the weekends to Lake Forest. So- it, um, Mark, let me ask you, know, you about the- Can I ask you about the qualifications of the boards? Like here, you know, the most run of the mill board would be 20% down. And then you start getting to buildings that are a little bit more serious about their finances is 33% down. The overwhelming majority of, of co-ops on the Upper East Side are 50% down. And then there are handfuls of buildings that are no financing whatsoever. And then there are certain rules. Each building has different rules with what is your post-closing liquidity? Do you have, do you, are, do you run the gamut of how how difficult the qualifications are in your on your buildings? I seem to be, as the lender, I'm, I'm usually the, the first person they talk to about that. Sometimes, I, you know, I work with a lot of agents who understand the buildings as well, because it's a small core, because it's a small group of buildings here in the city. But what you've just outlined really is reflective of what happens here. The top tier buildings are usually require the most amount down. They do look for post um, purchase liquidity to accept you at the building. They look at a number of things, but that's really the driver is money. And um, you know, then you have to kind of walk through because anybody at that price point, they're usually looking to do a major renovation, even though it's been redone. So yeah. then you go through the process with your plans and your decorators. And sometimes that happens at the front end. They'll talk about that in their meetings to get uh, the lay of the land on how that building likes to work because you have so many shared shared things like plumbing and all those kinds of things. So, so Carrie, just asking um, in here, let's just say you had two apartments that were absolutely identical. You had A and B. One's a co-op, one's a condo. Mm -hmm. The co-op, the condo would probably be 15% more expensive than the co-op just because of the flexibility of who can purchase it. Foreigners can purchase it. No board approval. You can sublet it. You can, you know, you have so many different options in a co-op because of the board approval process, the amount you have to put down, the amount of post-closing liquidity you have to have, uh, and the limited nature of being able to sublet it if you needed to makes it less appealing, right. but it's the better value. Does that play out the same way there? It does, but I'd say that ours is greater. It, you said 15%. I would say ours is... 40%, 30, 30 to 40%. So a $1 million co-op would be a $1.4 million condo. More. Ish. More. Wow. It's a big differential. 
Actually, no, it's probably double. Wow. You know, They're tremendous values. They really, they really are. are. It, it's like it's like the last, you know, secret in the city. So this 3500 North Lakeshore Drive would be a closer to a $2 million apartment if it was a condominium? Yes, for sure. Wow. Because of the square footage, you've got 3500 square feet. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different attributes to it, but absolutely. You know, we've got um things on Walton Street. I'm just thinking of another property at 2232 Walton. It, again, it's over 3000 square feet all on I mean just gorgeous details. And then you go down the street from that home to the Palmolive building, which is, you know, 159 Walton, you take the exact same unit, not, not apples to apples, but square right. footage wise and um, double. It's, it's unbelievable. So, um, but I think here in Chicago, and that's one mission that Mark and I have, are trying to do, to do is educate people more on what co-op living is and not to be afraid of it. And I think when people are afraid of, you know, the co-op world, they don't know what they don't know, they don't want to go for. So they kind of shy away from them. And that just unfortunately over the years has depreciated the pricing. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Uh, here, it's such, here it's such a large part of our housing stock. It's just where you get the most value. And you cannot do an apartment search or a home search without encountering the majority of, of it being co-ops. Yeah. We just, well, send some co-op people our way. They'll be they'll be loud. I, I'm oh, astonished God. at the price. I literally was I literally I thought to myself, could I uproot myself and live in Chicago? I mean, it's inc the value. Can you, John? Can you, you know, on her page, her initial her her. Uh, her website, it's that listing, right? Is there? Yeah. You have to see this. $1.1 million for this thing. That's Instagram. It's, it's an extraordinary value. But actually, if you scroll down on that page, hang on, let's see. I don't know where you're at. On Instagram? So, well, it's right. I mean, this is- You can't it's see the through, whole thing. That's $314 a square foot. That apartment here would be closer to $2,800 to $3,500 a square foot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This is your first page on your, uh, of your yeah. home page. Yeah. Is, is it here? I believe no, it's. I don't think it is there. So what I would do is just quickly at your um, search bar, go to app properties. It's atproperties.com. I'm just going to do, this will be the quickest way to get there. Okay. Okay. And then, is it funny that I, oh, select a region. You got to click Chicago because they don't know where you're at. There you go. And if you scroll down, there should be a search bar. I would think is that bad. You guys go back up. Sorry. I don't search on our own site. Oh, there it is, address. Put in 3500 Lakeshore Drive. And then North three, Lakeshore, 3C. There you yeah. go, you got it. That's cool. I mean, look at that building, isn't it? It's just- Beautiful. 1.1 million, everybody. 1.1. One. Who moves, in, as we're looking through these, who moves to Chicago and why? Oh, there, there's a lot. Where are they coming from? Are they coming because of the jobs? And if so, what industry? Yeah, I think that a lot of people are born and raised here in Chicago and they just don't leave. I think we've got a lot of... Um, well, that's where I was going. I'm wondering, is it 50% crosstown moves? People trading up, people trading down, downsizing, upsizing? Mm -hmm. I would say um, the last stat that I saw was about 80%, 80%. I think it's pretty high. That That's people. huge. We've got 35% crosstown moves in my market. How about you, Roberto? I, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know that figure. Well, make something up, Roberto. What do you think it is in New York? When you encounter somebody, are they more than half of the time moving across town? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I by far encounter more people who are just moving around within the city than people coming into the city for the first time. And the sticker shock that people have, I mean, it's always the same conversation. Like, I have a 4,500 square foot house. I think, well, this 700 square feet is going to have to do. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, it's like... No, we've got a lot of people that stay and they do because we offer so many different housing stocks. So as you move through life, you know, whether you're single and then you get married and then you have your baby and then you get your divorce and then you get your downtown condo, you know, there's all these different life movements and um, there's all different neighborhoods and housing stock. And again, I think our um, our pricing is so reasonable here. It is sticker shock when they do have to move. So you know, Carrie, tell me, this is currently listed, right? Correct. And when did you list it? That was listed about three months ago. And how many showing, I mean, granted, you're coming into the slowest part of the year, but how many showings have you had on this? No, we've had, um, we've had a handful on it. Again, since this is a co-op, it doesn't get as much traction, unfortunately, as a, a condo would. You know, if this was a condo, it would have been gone right? Yeah, the board yeah. in this building, and again, Mark can speak to this, the board in this building, um, they're very particular who comes into the building, which they should be. The assessments on this unit are high, and it's a particular person. The one thing that's hard about this home is there's no parking. And, you know, Chicago is a very drivable city. Interesting. Most everyone has cars here. We drive everywhere. So and having parking is important. How much can someone expect to pay for parking if it was in the neighborhood or in the building in a neighborhood like that? Um, we offer a lot of rental parking, which is about 300. But when you purchase parking here, we charge anywhere between 30,000 to $70,000 for a parking spot. And that's common. Well, parking here is very rare. I would say the overwhelming majority of people do not drive on a daily basis. There are definitely people, I have friends, they're always in their cars. I'm like, why are you driving? Where do you park? They're like, I always get parking. Yeah. Um, but parking can be very expensive. Like I park, I park 10 blocks from my house. I tank park under Lincoln Center. I pay like $550 a month. But if I were to park right next to my <laughs> bin, I'd park in like the next building over, it would probably be like 800. And if I lived on Central Park West, it would be 1600 and if I lived on Fifth Avenue, it would probably be 2000. Yeah. No, because we're such a drivable city here and we've got parking and everything, you know, it's again, it goes back to a very reasonable city to live in. Wow, it sounds and great. a lot of amenities. Are the amenities changing? We've been talking in New York about the changing mix of amenities and how some of the older buildings are having to add amenities to compete with the new new product. Can you talk about mm -hmm. amenities and the yeah, trend? We've, we've got a lot of new construction downtown and that there was kind of what I call the amenity war. It seemed like each developer was trying to outbeat each other with their amenity floor. And, you know, with um, younger consumers coming into the market, they wanted, that, right? They wanted that lifestyle and they wanted the convenience of it. So we had this some of these buildings with the amenities that they have, um, it's unbelievable. But um, the older buildings who obviously they, you know, didn't have all of that fun stuff, they are trying to, I don't want to say compete with them, but trying to, you know, up their game a little bit by offering them. So these pre-war buildings that you see, you know, they didn't have workout rooms. So they're starting to carve out rooms or spaces within the building to offer a workout room or a library or lounge area. But again, there are space constraints there. So there's only so much that they can do. But yeah, can there's a battle for amenities. Can we talk about the financing of some of these? Like, do you guys have a mansion tax or do you have transfer taxes? Transfer taxes, I'll let Mark speak since he's more into this. Transfer tax, but no mansion tax yet. We do have transfer taxes, buyer and seller does pay them. So there's a, a piece that goes back to the city. Both buyer and seller pay? Yes. And what's, no, no, what's, your, what's your mansion tax in the city? What's a graduated scale? It used to be if for any apartment over a million dollars, it was 1% of the, of the purchase price. And then about three or four years ago, they changed it. And it's a graduated scale where it's 1% up to 2 million. And then it goes up to, for example, if you were at a, if you bought a $5 million apartment, it's a 2.25% tax. If you were buying a $25 million apartment, it's 3.9%, which is almost a million dollars. That's the, and that's the buyer tax. The sellers pay a city tax and a state tax, which comes out to about 1.85%. Uh, 
or no, yeah, 1.85% between the two. You know, Roberta, you mentioned uh, similarities between co-ops here and there, and it's not called a mansion tax, but the, the co-op buildings do have the ability to charge um, a transfer tax on top of what the city does. And yep. many of them do. It might be like 1% of the purchase price. It might be 1.5% of the purchase price. But that goes to the building. It goes to the building, yes. Yeah, and we, here we call that a flip tax. Yes, we call, it, we call it a flip tax here as well. And that's usually negotiated a lot of times depending on the building, the market. Um, sometimes the seller will pick that up. You know, the origination of that was that it was a, it was a flip tax, which was a seller tax. So when you sell your apartment, you got to pay X back to the building, whatever the decided upon amount was. And then when the markets got really, really hot, it became a negotiation piece where a buyer would say, I'll pay your flip tax. And then the building started to actually flip it towards the buyer. And in some buildings like the San Remo, which is right over here, I mean, they have like a 4% flip tax, I think. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big thing. speed bump in the negotiation, you know, when you're, you know, it's like who's, and then it becomes a negotiable item as well, so. It, the numbers are smaller here, but it's still a negotiable item that is a smaller bump, but it's one we have to deal with. Do the banks have treat a flip tax in any which way where they did, you know, they, they see that as an expense to, to the buyer or because sometimes they pull it out. Uh, to, I know where you're going with this and yes, to answer the question, yes, it's a, it's a Fannie Freddie guideline and it, depending on how it's, it's spelled out in the, the lease agreement and the recognition agreement, we may have to deal with it or we might not be able to provide conventional lending. They may have to, if, they're, if they have enough wealth, they go to a private bank, if they want a loan on the property, they buy cash, which is common as well. But um, sometimes that is an issue that we have to get around and until the building resolves that on the paperwork. It's tough to do in the middle of the transaction. So I usually try to work on those things with the board prior to a live sale in the building. So we just had an example of a million dollar, more or less, uh, apartment. Uh, what's the total? So walk me through that as an example. The seller is going to pay 2%. The buyer is going to pay 2%. And then what's it going to cost to own it on a monthly basis, roughly? Are you talking about like the mortgage payment and all that stuff? No, I'm not worried. I, well, I'm going to pay cash. I just want to know what am I going to pay the government and what am I going to pay in maintenance? Because you said it was a high maintenance building. Well, I'm, I'm going to say the maintenance on a building like that might be about five thousand dollars a month, okay. and everything's included, including tax. Yes, property okay. tax is included in your assessment payment with co-ops. Okay, not with condominium. And my cost as a buyer for buying it is one percent. Probably two and a half. It's not very different from New York, it sounds like. And in Connecticut, we, we do not have buyer and seller taxes, although we're talking about it. And we did just, and we have a 1% uh, transfer tax uh, and we have a brand new mansion tax uh, at two and a half. You start to really pay at above two and a half million. So uh, that's brand new here. And uh, so Los, I'm glad Los Angeles hasn't gone there yet. Los Angeles is instituting a transfer tax just now. And it seems pretty hefty. I mean, I looked at the numbers, maybe I didn't interpret it properly. It looked pretty hefty. What, do you know what it is? It's, it's a, it's, a, there's different calculations for different price points. And I mean, I think, I think if I saw it correctly that it goes up to as much as, um, let me see some, if you buy something, if I look at this properly between uh, under 5 million, it's only half a percent, essentially. If it's between 5 and 10 million, it's 4.5%. If it's over 10 million, it's 6%. Yeah, those numbers add up pretty quickly. Yeah, that's substantial. That's going to have enough. It's going to have enough. It's going to have to be a price adjustment. Yeah. For that, because that's a, I mean, it's a something that's being new that's instituted. And apparently in one of the counties, it's already, I think like, Culver City or something, they already have it. It was instituted last fall, but these are just coming now, I think coming in March. Mm. So Carrie, tell us a little bit about how you started and how you, what was your approach and how you have gotten to really where you are because you seem to be setting the standard there. Well, it's been a long journey. I have to tell you that it's kind of fun, you know, talking about it. And, you know, when you say, like I tell people, I've been doing it for 22 years. So it's the markets have changed. Life has changed. I've changed. Right. You know, so there's a, a long history to it. But, you know, when I 
just a quick story of how I started. I actually worked at E-Trade before I got into real estate. And I mentioned that was back in the late 90s. And kind of a funny story is I worked at E-Trade. I was in advertising and I um, had traveled in all different markets. And I happened to be in Detroit one day and someone had come up to me and um you know, I was top of my game when I was at E-Trade and they came up to me soliciting me for a job. And they said, you know, we were opening up a Chicago office. We'd love to talk to you about, you know, you being part of our office. And I said, well, what company are you? And they're like, well, we're a new search engine and it, the company's name is Google and da, 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 da. And I'm like, oh my God, have you guys heard of AOL? Have you guys heard of Yahoo? There's no way especially with such a stupid name as Google, who's going to work there? I would ever consider moving my job. And of course, I didn't go to Google because I thought it was a stupid name. And, um, you know, like a, about a month later, I was just kind of evaluating my job of where I was. And I was like, gosh, maybe I should go work for that company, Google. But I didn't. And um, something had happened at, at work and I decided to take a walk that day. And the, again, this is in the late 90s. I took a walk from, we'll call it like city center, Chicago, all the way into a neighborhood called the West Loop. And, you know, it's about almost a mile west of the city. And at the time, it wasn't a great neighborhood. Um, in the middle of like nothing in this neighborhood, there was a construction site. And I stopped and I'm looking, I'm like, what is this? What are they doing? you know, like in the middle of this like rundown neighborhood. And the guys were asking me, get off the site because of course they've got the cranes and the diggers and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just standing there looking and this gentleman by the name of Tom comes out and he asks me kindly to get off the construction site. And of course I was always a very rebel spirited person. And I just started asking him, what are you guys doing here? What's happening? And he said, oh, we're building a, a residential tower here. And I'm like, Again, with my brilliant um, comebacks, I'm like, why Why would anyone live here? You know, it's such a terrible neighborhood. If you guys could see what West Loop looks like now, that was also a bad thing to say. And so we started just talking about the residential market. And he asked me why I felt like it wasn't a great place to be and who's going to buy it. And of course, I had my all my opinions, um, which he loved to hear. So he's like, you know what? He's like, are you in real estate? And I looked at him and I said, why, yes, I am. And he said, all right, come to my office next week. I want to talk to you. So I literally turned around, went back to my, my office, looked up, how do I get my real estate license? Signed up for the real estate class. Really, at that time, it was very easy to get your real estate license. You know, I signed up like that Monday. I met with Tom and I sat down with him and I said, you know, truth be told, Tom, you know, I... I don't have my license, but I'm in the process of getting them. I'm in class. So I felt like I wasn't lying to anybody. I was in class to getting my license and he was fine with it. He hired me and I worked on that project and it was the first development project. We sold it out like that. And ever since then, if you knew the West Loop, it just took off. So that's how I got into real estate. It was by oh chance. And where's West Loop in relation to like that city center? Just to the West of city center. So like the loop is the city center and it's just literally West and it's called the West loop. And that's where McDonald's is headquartered. Um, I don't even know. There's like a million companies that are there now. It's, it's just a phenomenal neighborhood. It's, it's, it's a great neighborhood to be in. Do you he specialize hired, in a certain part? I'm sorry, John, go ahead. He hired you. You have a, a, a very charismatic personality. You're sharp, articulate. But now you've got a team. I'm imagining that your high-end clients, they want Carrie. They want to know Carrie is on my case. Yep. And you advertise that you are available to your clients 24-7. Yes. But you have a team. So okay. talk to us a little bit about how you're organized for success mm -hmm. and how you organize your team and how you're able to um, do a billion dollars worth of real estate uh, at such a hot, giving such a high level of service and, um, and yet not be pulled in too many directions. It's hard. I'm not going to lie. I don't sleep. 
I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot. And um, I do have a fabulous team and it's, I've got a lot of support, right? You know, you've got to have your key people in the key roles here. Um, I truly love what I do. And um, I mean, I live and breathe real estate and, you know, service to me is, is important. And it's, I think, become more important over the years of just what clients expect from us. I mean, at the end of the day, we are fiduciaries to our clients, right? And I take the selling of their home or purchase of their home extremely personal and, and, um, and, and they feel that, they know that. And I think that has been, you know, part of my success and as cheesy as it may sound, as cheesy as it may sound, really being kind and being a good listener and being a good human being, I think people feel that. I think they sense it. They know it. And, you know, when a lot of people have worked with me and I, I'll go back and ask them, you know, thank you for the opportunity. You know, I know you, you know, you interviewed five different agents, you know, just why did you select me in the safe? Because I trust you. I knew it when I met you, you know, and that means a lot, right? Because the truth is they can trust me. You know, and, and, I, yet, and yet a lot of we we interview a lot of successful agents and many of them admit they cannot give up control. Roberto is an example of a guy who works on his own. I gave up control and I work with a team. So it's interesting to me um, the issue of giving up control and being able to deliver a high level of quality. Um, because Roberto's in control. I mean, they get him. But uh, in my case, uh, I had a client today say, how come John doesn't show my house? And I thought, you don't want John Engel showing your house. I've got better people on my team for showing your house. I'm better used, um, you know, in other places. There may be negotiation, maybe marketing, creativity, but not showing your house. Uh, Susan Engel, shows a house really well. So how do you divide the responsibilities among your team? Because you do work with a team. And how many people do you work with? Can you kind of identify, I have an admin I have, just so we have a nice perspective. Yeah, so I am, I have not given up control yet. So just so that you guys know that. Um, I have tried different types of um, team setup, if you will. And there's all different kind of ways to do our business. And really, because it's not that I can't give up control, it's, um, I guess it's I can't give up, <laughs> I can't give up control. I just, I want to be the one to show the house. So I am always there showing the house. So the way my team is set up, I have Zoe, Simona, and Micah. That's it. So um, Simona does, is she's more like the contract person. She's behind the computer. She's doing everything. Um, Zoe's my right hand gal in the field, right? So she's there with me on photo shoots and the video shoots. She's taking notes with me. She knows the property. She gets to meet with the sellers too. So if I do need a backup person, it is Zoe. They know that she's there. And then I've got Micah on my team too, who's also, you know, there in the field and kind of doing a little bit of everything for me. That's it. There's, it's very small. It's very boutique. I've tried branching out and, and having other brokers, but I, for me, at least when I feel like there's too many, I lose control and, you know, I don't want to be the biggest team in Chicago and I never will be, but and I like got Mark and you've got Mark, sure. Mark, <laughs> don't blow this deal, Mark, don't blow this deal. Right. Well, you know, right. I, I'm going to uh, chime in. She talks about a couple things working with Carrie and I work with a lot of agents in town. Um, when there's a lot happening, you know, whether it be at a video shoot or an open house, whoever she talks to, she has the gift to make them feel like they are the only person in the room. A gen and it's a genuine gift. And I, we, I talked to her. I, I said, you know, I, I've spent some time with you. You are probably the best listener I've met in the business. She listens to people, digests what they're actually saying, isn't thinking of the next thing to tell them, really listens to what they have to. And sometimes then we'll get back to them the next day after she's, you know, taken in what they've had to say and, and given her thoughts. You really feel like you've got um, like a spouse working with you. You know, somebody, it's, it's really like a marriage, you know, when you're going through that process of selling your house with that team. 
And she is a, a really a tremendous partner that way. I watched her do it. I watched many of them do it. And she's some of the other ones like yell and talk their way through it and they bully their way through it. And I sit there and watch her approach is exactly the opposite. And it's, it's why we're all enjoying listening to her talk today. I don't want to speak because I'm enjoying listening to her talk about the market today. She's fantastic at it. Thank you. You know, Carrie, it's interesting to hear you say that you like to be at all of those showings because it's one of the things that I like to do too, is it? You know, yesterday it was, we're about to list something and I'm about to list something downtown. And the owner said, someone within the building chat contacted me and they wanted to see the apartment. And I had a dinner, I couldn't go. I said, I can't do it. She said, I'll show it to him. And afterwards the guy already is like sent her an offer. And, and I was, you know, I, I peppered her with questions this morning. He's like, who, who, who what was he like? What was, what was his, you know, I just needed to, I, I need to feel and touch and understand who these people are in order to negotiate with them in order to know what buttons are I need to push in order to gravitate them to where I need to take them, you know? And without being at that showing, without seeing and touching them, or if I'm on a holiday and I have someone cover for me a showing, I, I just, I feel at a loss without be, having that touch to that client, to that buyer, to be able to negotiate. Same with it, same if I represent a buyer and I take them to a, a, a property and I'm dealing with a seller's broker, I spent a lot of time speaking to that seller's broker, just getting the nuance of what they're, you know, what did the seller, what's this, what's that, just understanding where they are in that deal process, because it will help me in the negotiation. John is much more skilled where he has the ability to just break it down in a different manner and just go in and, and go for the kill. He's like an assassin. You know, <laughs> I, I'm a little, I'm a little more nuanced than that. I think, you know, I, I, uh, I, I don't know. That's just the way I feel. So your approach and listening and being a good listener, that's how I feel. But with that, with that personal touch, how do you do such volume? And are, are you in an expansion mode of your business? Or are you like, I do, a, I do X number of volume and it's a lot and I'm good with it. I'm kind of good with where I am. You know, I, I want to be very thoughtful if I were to expand, you know, the team and just, it's got to be the right people because just like in any business, you know, it's, it's the people that you're with and that surround you and support you in your business. And I think it's, it's hard to find people that have the same, um, you know, like I always tell people, my job is to make the experience easy for my clients. And I want them to really service my clients. There's not a lot of people that I've met that I feel that are the right fit. And I wanna be very particular about people who I bring into my circle and who is gonna work with me. So um, if it happens, it happens, but it's just, it's it's gotta be the people that I'm with and I surround myself with. I got a question for you, cause I got it asked of me from a $15 million client. And I made a present, I went to New York, I sat in his boardroom and I said, you know, this is what we're gonna do for you. And he said, I want to understand your worldwide network. I want to understand that if I go to London next week, am I going to see my house in your London window? And so the question is, you work for at properties and in Chicago, and yet you're top of the market. Talk to me about the importance of brand. We're seeing an incredible amount of consolidation in the real estate business. We see real estate companies saying they're tech companies. We see others uh, gobbling up everything in sight, saying we're bigger than everybody else. Talk to us about what matters and where you're getting your business and what doesn't matter in Chicago. So again, Chicago's, um, we don't see a lot of international here as much as you probably do in New York. Um, at Properties, you know, acquired the Christie's real estate brand so that we do have this network that's broader than just here in Chicago. So we do have affiliates in this network that we can, we can utilize. Um, and that has become very important too to some of the sellers because again, since Chicago is such a destination city from a relocation standpoint, it is important to have those types of reach and that type of contacts out there. Um, outside of that, you know, just in general of networking with the right and key agents out there throughout the United States, everyone's moving, right? Everyone's fluid through the United States. So, you know, having um, 
a team and network outside of the Christie's, pro you know, at properties brand is important for me as well. Just like I said, we don't have a Douglas Elman here. We don't have, um, you know, Brown Stevens here. So we've got to just network. Can we no, talk like about, it. go ahead, John, sorry. No, go ahead. You're up. I want to talk about properties that need work there. When you find a property that's in estate condition or whatever, and someone has to renovate it, like how expensive is it for someone like here, it's gotten out of control. And we have Scott Hobbs here, who's one of the top builders in Connecticut and the Hamptons. He builds 20, $30 million houses and renovates. He's expert at expensive. You want expensive? Yeah. He is the poster child for $30 million dream homes. Wow. Yes. So, so I'm curious how much of a, like here right now, anything that needs work, for example, is selling for 70, 70, 70 to 75% of value because there, it's such an onerous process and it's become so expensive. Yeah. How is it there? It's about the same here. You know, buyers will, will pay more for homes that are completely done and move in ready, right? So those homes are getting more of a premium. The homes that have the 2007-ish finishes, you know, even 2010 finishes, they are struggling. So it becomes either a price point where the price has to be attractive enough that the buyer is going to come in and do their own work. And obviously, labor is expensive. Uh, materials are expensive. And then if they are buying into a high-rise building or a co-op building, then they have to deal with the board. So not only does it become a factor of um, you know, price of materials and labor, now it's time. It's their time that they've got to take out of their day to make all the arrangements in here. And there's some folks, again, that just do not want to touch it. So, you know, someone like Scott, you know, we've got all different types of companies here to come in and do the renovation of these units or do the updates is become key. But again, if a seller doesn't want to embark in that, then they've got to price the property to move. Yeah. Scott. You got anything, Scott? <laughs> no, I, think, I mean, I think that's that's the case. It, it's you know, doing renovation is expensive, but eventually, with the house or any apartment or any other stuff, it, it eventually expires unless you keep updating it. So that's the trade-off. Yeah. W would construction there be cheaper than here, Scott? Um, I, I'm actually in a building group with a guy out in uh, Chicago, and the answer is no. I mean, it, it depends on what, well, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do very high end stuff, the high end stuff is the same, it is equivalent. Um, if you're lower end, maybe you can get some sort of a little bit of a discount on things, but it's very difficult to work in the city and it's, it's time consuming and working inside co-ops and other buildings is again, not the most efficient uh, working environment. We all just saw the headlines that lumber prices went down. So we should all be getting a much better deal this year from you, right? <laughs> So much lumber inside an apartment fit out. I say sarcastically. Most of it is what, 85% labor? I mean, a whole ton of it's labor and the high material. And like I was in New York today and um, we were helping out in a building, but some other guys were doing another apartment. And you see how they end up carrying, you know, two by fours up the elevator one by one. So it's not you're getting a unit dropped off right where you need them. I mean, you literally have to carry them up in the elevator in a cart, one, you know, 10 at a time over a whole day to get enough to do any other sort of work. Is the supply chain better than it was? Uh, it's getting better, but you still aren't at that 100%. You know, you might still be able to now build 95% of what you need, but there's a missing 5% somewhere and that keeps changing every day. So. Right. Scott, who is your affiliate? You said you had an affiliate in Chicago area. Who is it? Uh, Power Construction. Oh yeah, they're big here. Yeah. They, their home building division is uh, part of my group. So. Oh. oh, wonderful. Yeah, they're a great they're a great team here. We see them all over the place. They're good guys. But great guys. Great. No, but it's probably easier to build. I mean, there's some parts of Chicago, some aspects of Chicago that are easier here. You know, we've got parking. You know, it's there's certain things that are easier. But he, but yeah, buyers don't want to take on um, they don't want to take on the projects. You know, and if they were to take it on, they want a significant discount in the price of the property. So there's a little bit of an imbalance of, you know, sellers that have that 2007 build and they think, you know, their Uba Tuba granite countertops are fabulous and they're, you know, they're 
you know, whatever their Crema Marfell bathrooms are fabulous. You know, it's just not what the market wants and they don't want it to, to be ripped out, but they want high price for their home. So there's a little bit of disconnect in some of the market. Do you have, do you have townhouses? Like here we have, you know, townhouse blocks and the townhouses are on the Upper West Side and the Upper East Side, they're sizable downtown. They're sometimes they're a little bit smaller, but what, do you have townhouses and what are the, the more or less the dimensions of them? Are they 20 feet wide houses? Are they five stories? Are they 6,000 square feet? We do have townhomes. Um, they're typically three to four stories tall. Um, they range between 14 feet wide, which imagine that. That's probably the, the smallest one I've seen too. I mean, some of them do get 20, 30 feet wide, you know, it could be a single family home. Um, so yeah. Account? This is a listing of yours, right? Art gallery, three stories high. Can I turn that into my next home? <laughs> actually can. That's actually a good story. So this is this former Wicker Park orphanage um, turned art gallery. So what that is, it's a 22,000 square foot building. Um, my client, Michael, had bought it years ago to turn it into a single family home. So Michael has actually the architect he's working with and designer are out of New York. Um, he has put in $11 million into that building already. Um, on the top where you see that orange band, that is, um, they hoisted over a million dollars of steel up there for his swimming pool that was going to sit on top of that building. Um, so at the $11 million mark of work keep in mind it's not done he had decided in the pandemic that he's done with chicago and moved to california and has not been back since so we have it on the market um it's it's um it's an unbelievable building and site it's six city lots which it's hard to tell from there and we have it listed at 6.7 million dollars um, what did he what did he pay for it originally the structure he bought it for 3.1 and um, he's put in, um, I don't know, 8 million into it so far. And a lot of that is infrastructure of the building. Um, they had to almost hoist the whole thing up and redo the foundation of the building because it was from the early 1900s. They've done all the tuck pointing, new electrical service to the building. I mean, it's the list goes on. It's, it's unbelievable. And actually, as a matter of fact, yesterday at a showing with um, um, a couple, they're probably in their 30s, and they're looking to purchase it and make it their home. Wow. All right, we only have a minute or so left. I'll start with Mark, and then I'll, I'll ask Carrie, give me your best commercial for Chicago. I already know that you're Midwestern nice. I already know that you're well-networked. I already know that you have the force of charisma that gets you hired on the spot with or a job offer on the spot with everybody you meet. But I want to know why would I move to Chicago, Mark? Why should I come to consider Chicago, Carrie? Go ahead, Mark. I believe having traveled a lot, my spouse um, travels the world for a living, so I tag along. It's one of the most livable cities I've ever been in. We've, we've been around the world and we just love coming home. Oh, that's nice. I'm going to go with our weather. We have fabulous weather here in Chicago. <laughs> Wait, Just what does that mean? Wait, what? <laughs> no, I, blowing all the it like I agree. <laughs> fabulous weather. You're right. Simply the best. <laughs> what is it today? And it's snowing. Um, I don't even know. It's probably in the it's, it's 36. 36. 36 it's 36 right now. Yeah. It's gray and cold and snowy. That's what it is here. But only for a month, right? And then it gets better? Half the year. Oh. So so what's summer like there, just quickly? I mean, uh, is summer, it that's why everyone lives here. We have got the most fabulous summer and fall here. It's glorious. I mean, but I will say to answer your question, I do think that Chicago is um, a world-class city. I mean, from the restaurants to the museums to all the culture that we have here, the art, it's, it really is a phenomenal city and, um, but it's livable. It is, it's truly, I mean, our real estate is easy. It's a drivable city. It's walkable. It's a fabulous city. Uh, December through May, our weather's a little iffy, but 
other than that, come visit us in the summer. You'll love it. I'll say this. If there was any other city we would live, it would be New York after this. <laughs> we, we love the city. It's, it's fabulous. So, Anything to sell them, Roberto? Is there anything left in New York to buy? No, but there, you are welcome here anytime. I got to tell you, this exploration, I've been dying to explore Chicago for so long. I was there once, and it was in August of 1988. I was actually at the first Chicago Cubs game that finished, the game that finished under the lights, because the first night of the first light game, it was rained out. Ah. Next, next day, the game was at like one o'clock. Rain delay till four, the game played, the game ended under the lights. So that was an amazing experience. But we did the Commodities Exchange, we did Art Institute of Chicago, we did all that Ferris Bueller stuff. And seeing how inexpensive it is and how actually livable it sounds. I mean, it really seems like a place that I just, I really, it's at the top of my list to come, come visit. visit and explore. I really, for sure. So I appreciate you being here and thank you so much for agreeing to do it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank this is a great show. Very, a lot of fun. And uh, we'll hope to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. See you, Skipper. Next week, for anybody who's interested, episode 72, we're doing the three beach cities of LA, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, and Hermosa Beach. So come on back next Thursday for the beach cities of LA. See you next week. See ya. <laughs>